Good morning and welcome to Calvary Grace. Will you bow your heads with me? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, as we begin this service, let your anointing just move and touch your people. Father, Lord, wherever they are this morning, whatever room they're in, whatever situation they're in, Father, just move right in. Be the healing balm of Gilead. Father, encourage their hearts, bless them, strengthen them, lift them. Let this be a great service, one that they will never forget. In Jesus' name, amen.
much for joining us this Sunday morning. It is wonderful to be with you. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, so this morning is going to be an awesome service. I know you're going to be blessed. Stay tuned. Praise the Lord. Now, as you know, we are meeting uh, in our homes today. And uh, we thank you for your understanding. And we're doing our absolute best to comply and uh, fulfill the requirements that uh, are expected of us. In the meantime, as far as we know, we'll be meeting again at the church very soon. Stay tuned. Keep your eye on Facebook. Those of you are that are on Facebook, those of you who are not, we'll contact you and let you know if the updates of when we'll be meeting back together again. And we know it's going to be very, very soon. Praise the Lord. In the meantime, you can see us on, uh, or you'll be seeing our services on Facebook, on YouTube. Don't forget to uh, like us, subscribe, and push the little bell. And also, while you're uh, watching this morning's service, be sure and uh, use the Donate Here button on our website. If you're not comfortable doing that, we're going to have an opportunity for you to come Sunday morning between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. and you'll be able to give your offering, stay in your car, and we'll be watching for you. And a uh, representative will come out with their mask on and a screen on, and all you have to do is wind your window down just a little bit and hand uh, over your offering. Amen. All right, well, why not let's uh, give our tithes an offering. I'm just going to uh, pray for the offering. Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for the opportunity to minister into your kingdom. Thank you, God, that you have given us all that you have. That you bless us with everything daily, Lord. All the needs that we've ever had, you've met for us, Father. And we just give you praise and glory. And we worship you, Lord, and thank you for the opportunity to minister into your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome to Calvary Grace. Uh, it's a blessing to be able to come into your homes or onto your telephones or onto your TVs or onto your computers, however you're getting this file. I'm just grateful that you're getting it. Will you bow your heads with me?
Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, just anoint the word that I'm going to bring this morning. Let it touch the hearts of your people. Let them be encouraged and strengthened as a result of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, one of my great joys in studying the Word of God is to find threads that seem to stretch through uh, either the New Testament, or the Old Testament, or the entire Bible. And there are many, by the way, that stretch all the way from Genesis to Revelation, the blood being the most obvious one. But there is another line of thinking that we pick up in the New Testament, which is very significant. And uh, let's just have a quick look and you'll see what I mean. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. It says, Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that causes them to fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they're destined for. Now watch this next line. But you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him that called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Come back with me to verse 9. But you're a chosen people. Hmm. Not the chosen, but a chosen. Significant difference. The chosen people were, to begin with, Israel. But God has now called us, the Gentiles, a chosen people. A royal priesthood. And here is some, a, a line of thinking that seems to carry right the way through the Bible and, and particularly through the New Testament. This idea of the believer being a priest unto God. In the Old Testament, an, uh, uh, an unusual statement is made, which is picked up by the New Testament and is quoted. Uh, take your Bibles, turn back to Exodus chapter 19, verse 4 for a moment. Exodus 19, 4. By the way, um, let me just explain the difference between a priesthood and the ministry, or what we have today, pastors. The priests were organized into 24 courses of priests. They would minister uh, sometimes 24 hours a day during particular celebrations. And uh, some of them had very specific ministries. Some of them were worship uh, uh, leaders and uh, musical ministries. Others were used for doing the sacrifices. There was uh, various divisions of these priests. And so when you're being told that you are a priest in the kingdom of God, it's not without purpose. It's not without use. It's not uh, that you're supposed to wear a clerical collar and walk around saying our father. Uh, there is something greater, something more powerful being said here. And it's different to being a pastor. We believe in the priesthood of all believers in Jesus Christ. All who are saved, according to the word of God, are going to be in this priesthood ultimately. You're in Exodus chapter 19, verse 4. Let me read it to you. It says, you, uh, you yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt and how I carried you on wings of eagles and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully, and keep my covenant, then all nations, um, pardon me, then out of all nations, you'll be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you're to speak to the Israelites. Although the whole earth is mine, 
He's zeroing right in now on Israel. You'll be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So right there, we see that the priesthood is going to be larger than just the Levites or those of the sins of Aaron. There's going to be this entire group or nation that he's speaking to here when he says to them, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Let's just try and bring that together a little bit. Turn to Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. And it says, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come. And from the seven spirits before the throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, he has made us, us to be a kingdom of priests, to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Here it is, a kingdom of priests. A direct quote from what he said back here in the book of Exodus. So the thought that starts out in Exodus specifically aimed at Israel, now being brought forward in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, actually, speaks to us, not only to the Israelites that may get saved, which would make them part of the church, but to us as well. He, will, he has made us to be a kingdom of priests. Now, by the way, uh, the King James reads kings and priests. And uh, the problem with that is that I've heard people actually preach and teach that some are going to be kings and some are going to be priests. No, that's not what it's actually saying. It's a direct quote from the Old Testament. And from the Old Testament, it's very clear we are a kingdom made up of priests. We have a king. We live in his kingdom. And we are priests that serve him. We have access to him. You know, the priests had access to the holy place. Uh, not all of them had access to the holiest of holies, but they had access to the holy place. They had religious duties. They served the Lord day and night. And we will serve the Lord day and night. That will be our job and our joy and our privilege for eternity. He has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. It's a remarkable thought when you think about it. That's how close we'll be. That's the access that we'll have. We will be those that serve in his in his kingdom, in his, if you will, even in his palace, in his throne room, uh, up into the, the heavenlies itself. Of course, to begin with, it'll be the thousand year reign. And the uh, Bible says we will rule and reign with him. But he's not going to put somebody there that is going to be, uh, you know, uh, demonic or on the other side and turn against him. He's going to put people into positions that have served him, that love him, that he knows, and he's going to make them to be a kingdom. Uh, of priests that will serve him. In Revelation 20, verse 6, it says this. In fact, take your Bibles and turn to Revelation 20, just a few chapters over from Revelation chapter 1, say 19 chapters over. Revelation 20, verse 6. It says, Blessed and holy are those that have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. They will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him 1,000 years. So during the millennial reign, we will be priests of God and specifically of Christ, and we will rule and reign with him. You see, when we talk about pastors and ministers, that's for now. That's for here. That's for today. That's for the equipping of the saints, the building up of the church, and so on. But when we talk about this priesthood that's to come, it's in the future. It will come, and Christ will bring it about. After the rapture, uh, the seven years of tribulation will break out down here. At the end of that, the Lord will come back himself. He will touch down in a place called Basra, 
and he will march from there all the way up to Jerusalem. And the Bible talks about treading out the winepress of his wrath. When he arrives in Jerusalem, he will appear to be covered in blood. And they'll actually say, who is this coming from Basra, whose robes are stained red with blood like wine? And he'll answer, it's me, uh, I, 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 I have come, I, I, and I'm, me and me alone have, have come to uh, fight this battle. And uh, there was nobody to help me. I did this myself. And, uh, you know, he will set up his kingdom. He'll vanquish the enemy that has raped the women and nearly destroyed the city. It'll be two thirds destroyed. He will come in. He will, with the breath of his mouth, simply uh, destroy the enemies that have come to destroy Israel. And he will finally set up his kingdom on Mount Zion. And by the way, Mount Zion, there will be topographical changes. Mount Zion will become higher than any other mountain on the earth. It will be beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. It's going to be absolutely remarkable. He will rule and reign from there. And that's where this priesthood kicks in. We will rule and reign with him. Now, ultimately, any decisions we've made will be under his authority under his direction, under his leadership. And the Bible says here, we'll rule and reign for a thousand years. Take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 15, verse 15. Romans 15, 15. And it says, I have written you quite boldly on some points as if to remind you of them again because of the grace God has given me. To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles with the priestly duty, isn't that interesting? He's, he's not from the tribe of Levi, and yet he's taking what's coming later and applying it to himself now and saying, with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So even though we don't move into that ministry fully until that time when the Lord sets up his kingdom, we are still charged with priestly duties and responsibilities down here today. Now, what, again, is the difference between that and a pastor? Well, pastors are, are those that are speakers for the Lord, uh, those that are shepherds of sheep, there are prophets and pastors and evangelists and teach and you know you go down the list all have a part in the body of Christ but the body of Christ all of them are ministers for the Lord and though that won't come to its full fruition until the time when the Lord has set up his kingdom we are even now charged with priestly duties and here is Paul saying uh, the, by the grace given me to be a minister of, the, uh, of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So he say, listen, uh, you know, even now I have this duty just like a priest would have. And no, when, you, when you hear the word priest, dismiss the Catholic Church from your mind. Dismiss the Church of England. Dismiss any church that calls its ministry priests because that's not what being referred to here. This is the priesthood of the average person who is a believer in Jesus Christ. This is not a group of people that wear priestly robes, that wear collars or uh, that are uh, able to quote special rights over people. This is not that group of people. Dismiss that from your mind entirely and think more of being charged by God to Take his, take his word and to take it to the world today and in the future, you'll rule and you'll reign with him under this authority of being a priest in his kingdom. Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we don't lose heart. Rather, we renounce secret and shameful ways. We don't use deception. 
We don't distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we recommend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. We don't use deception. Some years ago, there was a man who claimed to have a tremendous gift from God. And he could, he could call people out of the audience, tell them their name, tell them why they're there, why they came, and tell them that God had told him this and that in fact, God had given him a message for them personally. Now think about the impact that would have on your life. If somebody in a church service called you out who you didn't know you, never met you. And by the way, this man didn't operate in churches. He operated in auditoriums. And so the congregation was not necessarily his congregation. But somebody would, he would call him out. He would say, there's a John Smith over here to my left. Stand up. Now, John, you're here tonight because uh, you have a sore left knee and you're praying for your daughter. And God wants you to know this, this, and this. Very impressive. Until one day, a man who was a faker, a magician, saw this act, and it was an act. And he decided to come back the next night with radio equipment. So he came back the following night with sniffer equipment to sniff out the signals that were being sent to this man. And so what he began to hear was this preacher's wife in a back room telling him, now go to the left, three rows back, the man's name is John, he's the fourth seat in, and here's why he's here. And then the next thing he discovered was that prior to the service, they had people mixing in with the congregation who were specifically there to chat and get information and to record it and then it would be passed on to the wife who would then pass it on to the the minister and uh, he would uh, he would pretend this was something coming from the lord well now what happens if you had had this word of knowledge so-called word of knowledge over your life uh, and it is revealed to be a deception how destroying would that be to your faith Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways, and we do not use deception. Nor do we distort the word of truth. By the way, that man repented, and within about a year or so, he was back on the, on the platform doing exactly the same thing. Nothing changed. People's memories were quite short. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we recommend our, to our, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those that are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds, minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants. For God said, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show the all surpassing power from, is from God and not from us. We're hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Boy, if ever there was something that described 2020, it has to be that list. We are hard pressed on every side. You know, everywhere you go, you've got to wear one of these silly little masks. And uh, still, we're not crushed to death. We're perplexed. We don't really understand why the world is doing what it's doing, but not in despair. You know, we, okay, we're down, but we're not out. Persecuted, but not abandoned. There are many churches, ours included, that sit empty this Sunday morning because of a 
law that I think personally is unjust. I believe in obeying the law, but I believe it's unjust. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but hey, we are not destroyed. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, we have this ministry that we have been given and our competence comes from him. And it's not a ministry necessarily to be a pastor, a teacher, a preacher. It's a ministry of a priest that ministers unto the Lord. You see, pastors and preachers and teachers minister from the Lord to the people. But this ministry that we're talking about here is from us to him. We are ministering unto the Lord. That, by the way, is what worship is all about. But before we get there, let's take your Bibles for a moment and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. 2 Corinthians 3, 1. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter written on hearts, or our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you're a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not in ink, but in the spirit, on living, uh, spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from him. He has made us competent as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit brings life. He has made us competent. He has made you competent. You know, I, I, I think that many people are afraid to go out and speak about Christ for a number of reasons. One being that they might lose their job, another that they might become unpopular. But I think at least one other decision or one other line of thinking is, I'm just not capable of it. Let me tell you something. He has made you competent. He has called you a priest in the kingdom of God. He has given you a competence that does not come from yourself. You know, we, we talk about the peace that passes understanding. King James, peace that passeth understanding. It's a peace that comes from outside and doesn't come from us. And it's beyond our understanding. Well, so it is with our ability to witness and testify for Christ. If you will open your mouth, he will fill it. If you'll begin to speak, he'll give you the words. But he will not overrule your will. We have free will and we are free agents. But he will give you the competency. If you'll just take that step out onto the water and say, Lord, if it's you, bid me come. He will give you the, the competency. He'll put the words in your mouth and people will be affected by what you say. Not that we are competent in ourselves or to claim anything for ourselves, but our competency comes from God. He's the one. He's the one that gives us that great competency. And more than that, he has called us ambassadors. As priests in this kingdom, which will eventually come, our ministry has begun to start even now, and we have become ambassadors for him. Where I go, I represent my Lord. I represent my Savior. And by the way, what I do and how I conduct myself is the impression that people will get of my Lord and Savior. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, we come to this. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Boy, praise God for that. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So he has reconciled us to himself 
But he, more than that, he's given us a ministry to go out and reconcile people to God, lead them to Christ. That God was reconciling the world through himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Well, boy, what a great message that is. Instead of us going up to people and saying, listen, you're wicked and you're evil and you're horrible and you're going to hell. Why not come up to somebody and say, listen, whatever it is you've done, Christ is willing to forgive if you're willing to accept him. And he has committed to us a message of reconciliation. By the way, most people, not most people, many people think that we have a message of condemnation. That our job is to go and point out people's faults and sins. Well, actually, that's the job of the devil. And it's his representatives that are very good with condemnation. Our job is to bring reconciliation, not condemnation. And when it comes to condemning sin in somebody, that's not your job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. And believe me, he will do an excellent job of that. If somebody is a believer in Jesus Christ and they're living in a sinful way, they will never be happy. They'll never be comfortable until they deal with the sin in their life. Our job is to come along and bring reconciliation. Verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. You know, an ambassador lives usually in a foreign country. When, uh, well, let's take the country we live in here, Canada. We have ambassadors in every country, almost every country around the world. And they represent Canada. And they'll have a an office somewhere, and uh, when Canadians have a problem in their country, they'll go to that office, and uh, there they'll be treated uh, as Canadian citizens, and the ambassadors will represent the will and the, uh, the, the nation of Canada in whatever country they're in. Well, we are in an unsaved, ungodly world, and we are ambassadors for Christ. We represent him. And our representation is a ministry of reconciliation. We are the, therefore Christ's ambassadors, the, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. There's his, there's his message. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's Paul's great message. That's the message of grace. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Boy, how different it might be if people started to preach that message instead of the turn or burn message that most people preach these days. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7, he says this, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I'm less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past has kept hidden, was kept hidden by God, who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, by the way, not through a specific priesthood, but through the church, because we're all priests. His intent was that now through the church, the manifest wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. It's remarkable statements when you think about it. In him and through him, we may approach God with confidence. You see, we have this priesthood which allows us access into the holy place. And through what Christ has done, we have access into the holiest of holies. We're able to come right to him and say, Father, I am here in the name of Jesus. We have been granted an access that the ungodly and the unsaved do not have. We have a priesthood. 
It's in the order of Jesus. And under his authority, under his control, under his power. Well, as those that have a priesthood, just like the priesthood of the Old Testament, there were certain requirements on them. Uh, They were required to handle the sacrifices, to clean the temple, to restock the temple, to set things up and to keep the uh, temple system running smoothly. And uh, we too have been charged with responsibilities as priests. It says this, In, uh, where am I here? Romans chapter one, it says this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Where in the Old Testament, they were to offer animals. Now he's saying, listen, I want you to offer yourselves, but not as a sacrifice unto death, but as a living sacrifice. Every day, live above what your base instincts desire and want as a living, ongoing sacrifice. This is your spiritual sacrifice act of worship. In Hebrews chapter 13, we're given something else. Verse 15, Hebrews 13, 15. It says, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. See, this is what the priesthood did. They went in and they ministered to the Lord. They offered to the Lord. And uh, where is our, our pastors and our teachers and, and the various other uh, levels of ministry down here minister from God to the people? The priesthood ministered from the people to God. And so when they would bring in an animal to sacrifice it, they would have them lay their hands on that and then the priest would be the go-between. Well, we have a go-between and that is Christ Jesus. There is one man and one man only who is the go-between between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And so here in 1315, we're told this, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name, and don't forget to do good to those uh, and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise. You know, sometimes you don't feel like praising God. Uh, You know, I I can honestly say I have never hit my thumb with a hammer and said, oh, thank you, Jesus. Uh, Bless the Lord, oh, my soul and all that's within me. There are just some moments where it's just really hard, but that's why it's a sacrifice. That's why it's a sacrifice. Uh, As I've gotten a little bit older. I've had some medical challenges. And um, I got to tell you, when you're sitting in the hospital there waiting your turn or sitting in a doctor's office or waiting for that phone to ring, it's very hard to praise God. But if you'll do it and you'll make that sacrifice of praise, God will bless you. God will so bless you. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise through Jesus. We don't come in and say, uh, hi, Father, I'm here. We come in and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come through Jesus. And I, I'm just, I, I praise you and I worship you. I don't understand what's going on. I don't know why it's going on. It doesn't make any sense to me. I, I got to tell you, Lord, but I'm just going to praise your name because I know you know. I know you've got it together. I know you and, you know, I, I, I tell you what. My father died uh, almost exactly a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, within a couple of days. And at the time, uh, though we knew it was his time, he was 94 years of age and very ill, we did not know 
the details of 2020. He died in 2019. We didn't know what was coming in 2020. But I can tell you this, had he lived into 2020, this would have been the most horrific experience of his life. Number one, he could not stand to be cut off. He could not stand to be alone. He could not stand to not have constant outside fellowship. And I don't mean just on the telephone, but I mean people coming and going all hours of the days and night. That, that, was, that was his life uh, and his life's blood. Um, th there were so many things about, and, and the fear of, uh, of not knowing who might be carrying the virus into the house or out of the house. This would have been absolutely cruel. And so now when we look back, we go, well, it didn't make sense at the time, but now I see it, Lord. Now I see why he was taken out at this point. Now it suddenly makes sense. You see, we offer a sacrifice of praise through Christ, and it's the fruit of lips that, that confess his name in spite of the circumstances, because God does know what's going on. God does know why it's happening. God does know how it's coming about. He does hold the future in his hands. And so part of our job as a, as a priesthood is to minister our praises unto him. Well, also part of our job as the priesthood is to remember the Lord's portion. Remember the Lord's portion. The Bible says, give and it will be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together and running over. Many people think, well, the church is closed right now. We don't need to give. No, the church is not closed. We're doing as much right now as we have any other time. In fact, we're actually planning on doing more right now because the building is empty. And so we're thinking in terms of, uh, well, I'm not going to tell you right now. I want to surprise you when the time comes. But we're thinking in terms of a lot more things. And the church is not, is not closed. It's, it's not even shut down. It's just that... We are unable to all gather in one place at one time. But praise God, you've got a phone and you can listen to this on your phone. Praise God, many of you have computers and you can listen to this on your computer. And some of you wonderfully tech savvy people, bless you, are the kinds that can take what's on your phone and put it onto your TV and sit back and watch it on television. How remarkable is that? God has given us this technology to use and we are using it. Listen, in Numbers chapter 18, it says this, speak to the Levites and say to them, they're priests. When you receive from the Israelites the tithe uh, I give you as your inheritance, you must present a tenth of that tithe to the Lord's, as the Lord's offering. Your offering will be reckoned to him as a grain offering and a threshing from the threshing floor or juice from the wine press. In this uh, way, you will present an offering to the Lord from the tithes that you've received from the Israelites. From the, these tithes, you must give the Lord's portion to Aaron the priest. You must present it as the Lord's portion, the best and the holiest part of everything given you. What is he saying? He's saying, listen, as you receive tithes, as you receive the blessing from the Lord, then you give your portion, you give to the Lord. You don't forget the Lord's portion. Because you think, well, we're on holiday or the church is closed or something of that nature. There's online giving. We are allowing you to come between 11 and 1 and uh, drop your tithes off here Sunday morning. And, and don't think, well, there's some huge amount of people out there giving towards this church. You need to know there are people online and there are people on television who have literally tens of thousands of people giving to them. The proof of that is the size of their offices. They are massive, employing hundreds of staff members. We have two or three people all working free. Know this, your tithes and your offerings are important and will keep this church going throughout this time where we're unable to physically be in the same place. Don't think that your amount is too small. It is not, and it's a blessing and it will keep the church going. This should not rest on the shoulders of any one or two or three people. It should rest on all of our shoulders. And by the way, I tithe myself. 
In Romans chapter 5, verse 7, it says this. Pardon me. Revelation chapter 5, verse 7, not Romans. Revelation. He came back and took the scroll from the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and, the, uh, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You're worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for, for God from every tribe and language, people and nation. I remember many years ago watching a documentary on TV. I, I like documentaries. I think you learn something from them as opposed to soap operas where you learn infidelity. The documentary, this particular one, was on a tribe in, I believe, South America called the Yanomami. And uh, I, I remember watching them and thinking, I, 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 I can't believe the, the, the grossness of their lives. They, they would file their teeth flat, no painkiller whatsoever. Um, and uh, they, they just had what I would consider to be the most barbaric of lifestyles. And I remember asking the Lord right there and then as I watched that, could you save one of them? I mean, is, would it be possible to save one of them? How would you get a Bible into their language? How would, you know, how would, how would, how would? I had so many thoughts about this. And then finally, I let it go and uh, I just uh, dismissed it. And some years later, on a Christian TV show, they introduced a man who was the chief of the Yanomami. He had gotten saved. And as I understood it, he ordered the entire tribe to get saved. And there was a small revival amongst them as they had come to Christ. Because you were slain with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. Now watch verse 10. You made them to be a kingdom of priests and to serve our God and to reign on the earth. And there it is again, all the way from Exodus. You've made them to be a kingdom of priests. He starts out and he says, Israel, if you serve me, I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests. And then it's repeated in the New Testament again and again and again. And finally here in the book of Revelation, under the hand of John and the writing of the Holy Spirit, he says, you have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God and to rule and reign on the earth. And I looked and I heard the voices of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they sang, worthy is the lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. By the way, that's the job of a priesthood. They are bringing praise to him. And they're gathered around the throne. And they're calling out, worthy is the lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven on earth and under the earth and in the sea, and all of them singing. You know, a lot was made in the 1970s, 80s, and even the 90s about whale songs. And by the way, uh, you know, I love animals. You have no idea how much I love animals, but there is nothing more boring than listening to the whistling of some whale uh, under the water. And uh, I'm sure there are people out there that disagree. Some that can interpret it and know exactly what the whale is saying. I don't, to me, it's just a bunch of squeaking and it's nonsense. Um, but I just imagine that all of the animals are going to sing together. Creation itself is going to sing together and praise him. But those that will be the leading group will be the church who are in fact a royal priesthood designed to bring praises to the king, to him who sits on the throne. To the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped him. Will you bow your heads with me? Lord, I just thank you that you have appointed us 
not just to minister here, but that there will come a time when our ministry will be to you. Father, at the moment we minister into the world that we live in, but there's coming a time when we will minister to you and in your name and by your authority. And we will truly be priests in the kingdom of God. I thank you for that privilege, Lord. Now, Father, use this message to touch the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Uh, I'm grateful for the technology that God has provided us. And uh, we just want to send you off with a blessing. Father, in Jesus' name, bless your people. Cause your face to shine upon them. Open doors for them. Sustain them. Keep them. Uplift them. Let them, Father, be the apple of your eye. Protect their health in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you.